Welcome back to Recap, QQ yapping away as Johnny D makes the pretty stuff for you to look at. Let's start out with the important headlines from the week. The biggest news is that SPJ Senpai noticed us. As I mentioned last video, a couple of weeks ago was Ethics Week for the Society of Professional Journalists, also known as the SPJ. During that week, we were determined to raise the journalistic ethics issues that we had been concerned with for all this time. The top posts in the SPJ Ethics Week hashtag were almost all related to the concerns of Gamergate participants. Of course, lazy trolls decided to have their fun too, and about a dozen troll accounts decided that there needed to be more blood and gore and poll-style anti-Semitic humor in the tag. Remember when trolling was fun and clever? Ah, those were the days. Anyway, through a combination of ignorance of Gamergate and the trolls scaring them, most of the SPJ did not address the concerns of Gamergate at all. Except Michael Koretsky, a national board member of the SPJ, who posted an article on May 4th on his personal website. Now, get this, he actually tries to get both sides of the story by researching both what Vox says and what the Gamergate wiki says, quoting both in his article. Wait, someone trying their best to get both sides of the story? What a revolutionary idea! He goes on to explain how most of the SBJ was too intimidated by Gamergate's reputation or by the shitposting in the tag to address our concerns. When he insisted on talking about it publicly, the SPJ made a formal statement about how they, quote, did not want to take the risk of exposing anyone within the organization to harassment or threats. But with fucking balls made out of cast iron, Koretsky stated that, quote, so much for the bravery of journalists. SBJ looks at its hashtag as a tragedy, but I see it as an opportunity. The good news is Koretsky noticed us doing good things too. He noticed how the SPJ ethics chat held on Twitter was basically all SPJ members and a couple of Gamergate participants. Namely, I am Iron Van and the Ivy Clover One, who were both civil and constructive when discussing Rolling Stone's recent journalistic failings. To stroke my ego a bit, Koretsky noticed me specifically tweeting in the hashtag and called one of my tweets out as an example of someone participating in Gamergate who was actually concerned with journalistic ethics. Mmm, feels good, man. My one paragraph summary of the article is that Koretsky noticed that there is clearly something related to journalistic ethics going on on one side or the other, and that Gamergate shouldn't be stereotyped as a bunch of bad trolls. He stated that gaming is a multi-billion dollar industry that reaches over half of the population, and that he had witnessed poor journalistic practices in games journalism for himself firsthand. He offered a call to action at the end, namely a request for Gamergate to, quote, go legit. And we delivered. I wish I could congratulate each one of you individually, because you all did exactly what needed to be done. Over 100 comments were left in his article, and most of them were civil, and all of them demonstrated to Koretsky that we are definitely interested in journalistic ethics issues. Koretsky has published more articles since, stating that he has decided to dedicate the annual conference that he can organize due to being an SPJ board member to the topic of Gamergate. The conference will be called Airplay, and basically he's looking for three to five people to represent both sides. He already has a shortlist from the numerous straw polls and nomination sessions that Gamergate has conducted. He will choose a committee to review the shortlist, and committee members will have the final say in who gets to be there. This conveniently eliminates the problem of Gamergate appearing to be electing e-celeb leaders, something that goes against the individualistic core of what the Consumer Revolt stands for. If you're still concerned this is a trap, I would suggest listening to Koretsky being interviewed on the original Gamer podcast. I put a link in the description. It put almost all of my fears to rest when I heard what he actually had to say. So I don't think that this is the be-all end-all of Gamergate, or that this is guaranteed to be a good thing for us, but I'm very interested in seeing in how it turns out. The conference is not until August 15th, so there's bound to be more developments before then, and I'll follow closely and keep you up to date on them. The next bit of exciting news is that Bone Golem decided to go live with Operation Deep Freeze, opening the site deepfreeze.it to the public. This site was a brilliant idea that happened early in the Consumer Revolt, but it took a lot of time, patience, and hard work on the part of Bone Golem to see it to fruition. Basically, the idea is to have a site that catalogs the ethical failings of all the games journalists, keeping these failings frozen in place for all time. It also has articles on several incidents of journalistic suckiness related to Gamergate, and contains Gamergate-relevant trivia on each journalist as well. Oh look, there's her inappropriate relationship with Anna Anthropy that we covered in one of our recaps. 
Oh, and there's her extensive coverage of Gone Home, complete with undisclosed personal and financial relationships. Actually, everything that's been dug up on her so far is listed here. And that's the point. It's a record of all of this in one convenient place with links to evidence and a superb presentation and style. Games journalists are already getting upset. Brendan Keough called it a hit list and urged people not to share links to it. Many, many others repeated the misconception that this was just a list of people doing things that Gamergate doesn't like, often cherry-picking entries from the trivia section of some pages as proof that Gamergate knows nothing of ethics. Here, let me just read an entry from the SPJ Code of Ethics. Avoid conflicts of interest, real or perceived, and disclose unavoidable conflicts. I don't know, uh, what would this look like? It might look like being good friends with the subjects of your writings, maybe? How about this other item? Refuse gifts, favors, fees, free travel, and special treatment. Hmm, that definitely includes people paying you money on Patreon. No, Catherine Cross, we're not criminalizing friendships. We're teaching these journalists that such friendships need to be disclosed, plain and simple. And ideally, they should recuse themselves from writing articles about friends if at all possible. Overall, Deep Freeze is a super useful site, and the reaction to it is already demonstrating that those opposed to discussing Gamergate and the related scandals have no concept of what actually constitutes a breach of journalistic ethics. Finally, I wanted to go over the Games Press reaction to the bomb threats issued against GG and DC. Let's go from best to worst. First, James Fudge wrote possibly the best article on the topic for game politics. He confirmed with the DC Metro Police that the threat was credible. He got comments from people involved. Journalists Kathy Young and Milo Yiannopoulos, freedom feminist Christina Hoff Summers, and even Jeopardy! Wonk and progressive Twitter shit poster Arthur Chu. Fudge did next to no editorializing. He even offered disclosure that he was a member of Game Journal Pros and the disclosure that he might have a negative bias towards Breitbart. I want to call out James Fudge for his excellent and exemplary coverage. Next, Owen Good and Polygon. Yes, I'm actually going to compliment a Polygon article. <laughs> Editorializing was kept to a minimum. He reported the facts, he reached out to the DC police, and described the Gamergate Consumer Revolt in neutral terms, taking a show-both-sides approach. Thank you, Owen Good. You did, uh, well, good. Now we move on to the meh Kotaku. For some reason, they picked Jason Schreier to write the article. Jason Schreier is widely disliked by Gamergate participants, and he himself admits to distaste for the Consumer Revolt right in the comments of the article. While he does report most of the facts, he also engages in editorializing and had to issue a couple of corrections. He stated that Christina Hoff Summers was a critic of liberal feminism when, in fact, she is a liberal feminist. This was corrected to say that she's a critic of contemporary feminism. His description of Gamergate emphasized the harassment angle too. He even editorialized in the headline with the original headline reading apparent threat. This was later changed to say bomb threat once the police confirmed that the FBI thought it was credible. However, this is still milder language than when he used the words terror threat on the bomb threat that Anita Sarkeesian received, and that is even after the police stated that the threat was not credible. At least Schreier discloses his bias against Gamergate, but couldn't Kotaku at least find someone not so intimately involved to cover it? Now to dredge the bottom of the barrel. Destructoid's Jonathan Holmes wrote an article full of editorializing. In it, he states that being suspicious about the credibility of the threat is a rational position to take, due to Summers and Yiannopoulos only taking an interest in gaming recently. Hmm, don't you social justice types have a word for that? I think it's called victim blaming? He also parrots the tired media straw man that Gamergate started as a smear campaign against that indie dev by her ex-boyfriend. Congratulations, Jonathan Holmes, you get the Worse Than Kotaku Award. But the grand champion of shitty reactions? That goes to John Walker, founder of Rock Paper Shotgun. Why not take victim blaming to a whole new level by asserting that Gamergate participants receive sexual gratification from getting bomb threats? Of course, Rock Paper Shotgun is not going to cover it, because credible threats of mass violence in the gaming scene are not worth reporting on, right? I mean, only threats that the police deem not to be credible are worth covering, right? So let me do my own little bit of editorializing. John Walker is a giant douche canoe. Wait, wait, perhaps you'd be more aptly described as a giant douche ocean liner. <laughs>
And that's all I have time for this week, folks. You know the drill. All us YouTube e-celebs gain inches to our e-peens for every subscription we get, and we gain in girth every time our videos are shared on Twitter. So I appreciate the help. Thanks for watching, and tune in next time for more.